Hello and welcome to Flutter and AGL Deep Dive. My name is Joel Vanarska and I work for Toyota Connected North America. Quick introduction. Spent a fair amount of time at Qualcomm and the Windows BSP org. Did a lot of interesting and important things there. Um, after that, I started at Inrix just right after OpenCar had been acquired. And I was uh, brought in to do back-end native code and optimizations and commercialization focus. And um, a lot of interesting things happened there. Spent a lot of time on Chromium and just the general design of the browser and what um, needed to be adjusted. And that's when I started looking at Embedded Flutter as a viable solution to replace um, JavaScript-based UI UX, um, not just for automotive, but just in general. Pure, craft, pure watercraft, spent some time, um, bare metal, electric drivetrain, CAN bus. That was a lot of fun. Multi-battery packs, etc. cetera. Um, and then moving back to Microsoft Surface, I was present for the launch of the Surface Pro X, uh, which runs the Qualcomm 8CX. And I'm the author creative, creator of Metaflutter and the author and owner of IVI Home Screen also known as Flutter Auto to the AGL community at Toyota. Embedded Flutter. The components, there's a development environment, a build environment, and a target environment. The Flutter engine is the core component of the Flutter technology. It's written on C++ 17. There's a common source tree for all platforms that are supported. Desktop, Mac, Windows, Linux, mobile, Android, iOS, web, Fuchsia, and custom and better. The build environment is based on Google GN. It's a combination of Dart and Skia. Impeller is coming into the scene. It um, will be replacing most of Skia, short of some text layout. And the custom and better backend support supports OpenGL, software-based rendering, Metal, and Vulkan. Some of the benefits, you get a premium user experience, a developer experience that's consistent amongst most targets. You have access to a commodity talent pool. You reduce your NRE, non-recoverable expense, and improve your time to market. The development environment. So while evolving the development environment, for AGL, the goal is to have the shortest path to run a Flutter app on AGL. Something easy to change between Flutter SDK versions, support unique configurations, archive friendly, also known as LTS, and Ubuntu 20 support. A solution I came up with is Flutter Workspace Automation. Show a quick demo of that. So I'm running a Python script that's present in the MetaFlutter layer. And what this does is it goes out and grabs all the components needed to develop with Flutter in an embedded Linux environment. And it installs all the packages, runtime dependencies. Um, depending on what the configuration is set for, it'll pull a variety of repositories and locate them into the workspace container. So once the container is present, then we can I'll start using it. It takes approximately two minutes on a reasonable internet connection. And um, so it'll pull down a, a debug uh, Flutter engine and better, and better build. That'll pull down the Flutter SDK. And as I mentioned, the uh, application repositories, if defined. Um, and then it'll pull down an AGL QMU image, depending on the architecture. Um, and then it will set up all the uh, custom devices that we have defined in the configuration file. The configuration file is a JSON file. And that JSON file can be tailored and customized to an organization's needs and uses. So if I have a team that focuses on a 
you know, coffee maker product and it's a particular target and I only have certain repositories, well then you can create a standalone configuration file. So when a new team member joins, they can just run the script and they have the exact same environment as you do, um, etc. Or internally at a large corporation, you may have different groups focusing on different areas of embedded Flutter, so they each would want their own um, environment. So that's what um, Flutter workspace automation here is about. So as soon as this is done, we will, uh, and there we go, it's installing Flutter Auto desktop build. I'm running this um, demonstration on Ubuntu 22. Uh, this is supported on 20, 22, etc. Um, Fedora and Mac M1. We recently uh, merged the port for that, and that's based on QMU opposed to the virtualization support that was recently introduced in um, Ventura, which just recently came out. So right now it's pulling down the QMU image. So, so far I've, I've opened a terminal and, and effectively cloned a repository and executed a script so far. Now, once you've set up your environment, or once you've created the um, workspace, there's no need to rerun the script unless you want to put your environment into a known state. So there we are. We're complete. Now, if we, we need to source our setup environment file, uh, as we can see, it prints out a list of custom devices that are available. The ID parameter here is the name that we will use to run an application. So if we go in and look at this, we can do flutter run dash desktop auto. And what will happen is it's going to build and deploy And we will see a Vulkan backend enabled uh, Flutter Auto run on the desktop. And it's getting the, all the elements for the gallery. The gallery has a fair amount of elements. And what it'll do is it'll install those into the hub cache, which is located within the Flutter workspace. So that's downloaded and um, it's built the bundle. And now it's launching the Flutter Auto. And it popped up on the primary screen. Um, so let's see. That's that. So you can also change the default size of it, etc. And then from here, I can um, launch the debugger if I so desire. It asks me every time I, I do this. So now here's the uh, debugger. So we're looking at the Flutter hierarchy. Performance, etc. This is all functioning on the host. This is running um, Ubuntu native and uh, all the features that you have that you get on the target, you get on the host and vice versa. So let's close that out. Cue to quit. Okay, that's the quick demo of what that looks like. And now back to this guy. So what does it do? It creates a, a Flutter workspace, clones the Flutter SDK, sets up a local Flutter SDK config, sets up a local pub cache, fetches defined artifacts and installs runtime dependencies, clones defined repositories and creates a setup environment that shell. What's, what's in a workspace? Flutter SDK, a sandbox Flutter SDK config, a sandbox pub cache, platform setup, runtime binary, Required dependencies, custom, excuse me, device config, 
and then development repositories and a VS Code Launch.json. So one install method from the AGL source tree. So the there's a configuration on MetaFlutter that's specific to the targets that I build on MetaFlutter, and the configuration is specific to uh, Meta AGL Flutter when working with targets there. So it's locked to the Flutter SDK version that uh, AGL is locked to. So Meta Flutter is typically going to be locked to a newer version than AGL is. This is an install method to get the tip of tree. The script options are listed as follows. So using this script, you can effectively just pass in the Flutter version and it will update your Flutter version for you and, and, get, and pull down the debug Flutter engine required to run and allows you to quickly swap uh, versions. So if you have a question, like say your team is fixed at 331 and you're not sure about compatibility, someone can run the script, bump it up to 337 and see if everything still runs and works. That's pretty handy. There are some setup caveats with this script. Um, so Flutter IDE tooling uh, does some things like uh, file watching and they do automatic triggering and it, it's, it can't interact with, um, if you're updating a repository um, to a different commit or something like that, then all of a sudden the, the IDE, which has a potentially a different Flutter in its path, will then attempt to do some things with it on the wrong version of Flutter while you're trying to install one. So the, the approach is you basically create your environment external to your tooling. It's handy to create a terminal window and, and visual you know, code, but I, I suggest not doing that. Multiple Flutters entry in a system path. So the script will remove the first occurring instance from the path that it resolves. Um, it's possible to fake it out and have like, I've seen a scenario where someone had three <laughs> Flutter instances in their path. They weren't, you know, and so that was a problem. And so we had to go through and clean out all the instances and then that fixes the problem. So your host machine is expected to have hardware hypervisor support. Um, this is, this is old actually. We, and check in about a week or so ago, hit dynamically checks for the SVM. CPU support and sets that automatically for um, x86 versions. For ARM64 on M1, um, it's enabled by default. So debugging on Flutter Auto Desktop, the demo I provided um, a little bit ago showed that working. So I'm in a, so GDM stands for GNOME Display Manager, and by default you can It'll run an X11. If you have Fedora, by default, it'll run a Wayland session. So you have to manually select Wayland, depending on what version of Ubuntu you are. In the login screen, there's a little gear symbol. You click on that and it'll say Wayland. And then, you know, depending on your hardware, you may have to play around with some parameters to get your Wayland session functioning with your video drivers. Um, think pads with NVIDIA hard, discrete hardware. Are, are a lot of fun, but it works. Uh, you just have to do some searching on the internet. Um, open it. So you log into your Wayland session. That's sort of expected for people who are working on Wayland to understand how to set that up. So log in via GDM Wayland session, open a terminal and type um, source Flutter workspace. It's implied that's set. If it's not, you, you would now, you know, select the directory and then set up your environment. Navigate to your favorite app. Flutter run and a device name, desktop auto. So the demo I did is gallery. And then debugging on an AGL QMU image is a little different um, because you do have a um, SSH connection on a given port. So you open a terminal, you source your environment, you type QMU run, you wait until QMU image reaches the login prompt, and then you um, make sure you have connectivity to the target the, the, at localhost and make sure that your known hosts are happy. Um, so if we look at that scenario here, remember, 
All right, I go into an application I want to run on my AGL QMU. And um, so if I want to find out which devices are present, I can do flutter doctor V and it will list out at the end the connected devices. So using that uh, second column there is the device ID. So if I say flutter run device AGL QMU, uh, it will then um, see we're still working on this part. Looking at debugging using Visual Studio Code. So looking at a um, command window that has it set, the environment, um, we can simply um, open that up directly and um, take a look at that. So on this one, it's created a VS Code launch file, and notice the different um, entries here. Pretty much it takes everything in the config file and makes a target for each given repository. So if each, whichever repo listing has pubspec path set, which means it gives it a valid path to the pubspec YAML, then it will generate a a target. So if we go into this workspace, now notice I, I have all these options. So say I want to look at Flutter animated background on desktop auto uh, debug anyway. It's building launching. And there we go, we see that. And then I have the, um, it popped up on the other monitor. So let's move that over. We need some flickering. It's my dual monitor. There we go. Now let's maximize it. And then there's controls here. You can specify it in min speed, max radius. Fill, count, I really get crazy with it. And that's, uh, there's a variety of different options on this uh, app. And I talked about the VS Code launch, how custom devices work. This question has come up a couple times. So uh, in, um, I go to console, and um, if I type uh, footer doctor, there's verbose and very verbose. If, when I type dash v, I got a list of all the devices. If I type dash vb, I got a whole lot of more stuff. It becomes very verbose. Notice there's some commands intermittent in there. So it, um, what that is, is some of the output of the ping. So inherently in the tool chain, when you have, so if I say flutter config at the bottom, there are a series of settings. Notice that custom devices, enable custom devices is true, as is Linux desktop. So those are the only ones enabled. And by default, when you run this flutter workspace, it's going to persist, right? Because there's a sandbox.config folder and then I update the XDG uh, home path unique to this environment. And so these are independent of what happens in the user uh, config. So in the home folder dot config, it gives it a, a, a sandbox home and that's where these exist. So if I go and 
open a new terminal, and then I uh, let's just say we look at ls config. Let's do tree config. There's a lot of things that are stored here by the Flutter tooling, right? And um, maybe a better thing is to do this. So there's some of that, and then the other thing is. The pub cache is also sandboxed, right? Meaning it's within the container of our workspace. So the config that has to do with when I type flutter config, it's interacting. Let's see, I'm in the, I haven't set my environment. So we'll go back to where the environment is set and look at our config. So I have uh, multiple items enabled. So as long as custom devices is enabled, it'll attempt to query and ping them. So the best place to uh, take a look at the interaction with custom devices is uh, with Visual Studio Code. So let's take a look at that. So here we have a view of the Flutter workspace, the root. I've opened the root up and this Flutter workspace config is what I use to create my workspace. And we notice, for instance, in the top one, Desktop Auto, this is a, a custom device that uh, I interact with. There's a section on here called, uh, with the key of custom device, right here, and it's ID Desktop Auto. So what happens is the script will insert these into the um, Flutter configuration um, of the custom devices. So let's take a look at that under dot config flutter we have a file custom devices.json and this file is managed and maintained by the flutter tooling so when i run the script here it interacts directly and modifies and updates custom devices external to the tooling and it leaves it in a state which uh, is usable so if uh, for instance you have this is the configuration this override existing uh, key value if that's set to false that means if it queries the custom device file and doesn't find um, and finds the same entry, it won't overwrite it. So that's just to provide some flexibility. Uh, but normally it will just uh, overwrite what was there already. Uh, so if there's a change in this setup and you rerun the script, it would overwrite the existing one in your um, Flutter workspace config. So in here, uh, this expands out exact. There's some um, name value, uh, sub some value substitutions that happen in the script. So custom device, um, as is, it won't show up as is. For instance, this one has a Flutter workspace variable. This one up here has bundle folder. Um, these all get uh, string substituted prior to writing to um, the configuration file. And then this represents the, the post expanded strings, right? So it's uh, this is the literal version. The config just provides some shortcuts from having to type things in all the time. So um, what happens? Uh, the interaction with custom devices when when Flutter Doctor dash V is run, or Flutter um, Doctor dash VV, when we see the verbose output, we see the tooling uh, execute the ping command and then implicitly it's waiting for the this um, success regex value and if it matches then it will list the custom devices being available in the uh, out the flutter doctor output um, and also if you don't specify a device and there's more than one it'll prompt with a list of all the custom devices that are um, available and so the availability is determined by this ping and success regex response. So if I was running, in this case, if I were running a X11 session and I issued this command, I'm expecting type equals Wayland, then it would, uh, it would fail, right? So it wouldn't list it as being available. So for instance, on an M1 Mac, when you run this, it'll execute the ping and then you know, it'll obviously fail on the M1, and so it never shows up as being available, even though the, the device is defined in the config. 
So it's fine to have it config. If it doesn't respond, then it just isn't listed. So in the case of AGLQMU, this one will check and see if port 2222 is open. Just that's the, the gating check, right? If port 2222 is not open, that would indicate that your QMU session is not running. Okay, and in another scenario, we have this where it'll issue a ping with the uh, host name, right? This is, so Avahi um, daemon is configured on the image, this device sitting on the network, and so it will broadcast, you know, its name, and it will get resolved to an IP address uh, via that, multicast DNS, and then uh, that way you don't have to put an IP address. And, you know, yes, it does a, a query, and but it also makes it portable. So in that case, ping, this response here is what determines uh, if it's there. And then the same thing is going to be for uh, this device, the Pi 02W Weston. It just um, pings with a different host name, right? Same pattern. This one here is saying it gives a different response. So that's how the ping sort of establishes the uh, configuration when you type Flutter Doctor uh, dash B or when you type flutter run and say you have more than one of these uh, custom devices available so then it'll prompt you to enter enter that value so once the the ping in response is present then what happens when you say you type uh, flutter run dash d and, and in this case if you specify desktop dot dash auto uh, then uh, there would be the series of callbacks that would happen you have post build install uninstall and run debug and so in what I do in install is I effectively create the bundle folder, uninstall will, and I, and I, um, I, I basically cache it and then I push it uh, over to the temp folder. Uh, and this is on a, in a, a host scenario, right? So it's all happening in the temp folder. Um, one, another approach that I may expand that to is as use some sim links um, that point to the um, Flutter Assets folder, uh, which would be a better scenario than your hot reload would work on a host scenario. Uh, in the case of uninstall, it just removes the folder. And for run debug, I'm invoking uh, Flutter Auto with uh, two um, flags. One is a JSON flag configuration, which you'll notice if we take a look at that uh, scrolling over in the workspace, notice that's in the workspace, uh, and dot flutter auto default config. So let's take a look at that uh, default config, and it's passing in parameters of the cursor theme and the view size. Now, the other thing it's doing is passing in the bundle folder, right? So that's uh, that's easy. In the case of AGLQMU, um, it's a little, a little more tricky. Um, there's uh, a couple of things going on. So one is it's expected that you have an SSH um, connection available to the target to begin with. So if like there's no um, input handling, bash input handling available with the Flutter tooling, so you need to externally pre-connect to the device and ensure that uh, it, it's connecting. So in this case, I created a copy of the bundle folder off into a um, location. And then I uh, talk to the QMU instance um, and tell it to delete the password for AGL driver. So this allows me to, because AGL driver is the user in the case of uh, um, the OS where you log in, you have root and then you have AGL driver. And if you want to invoke applications and have it show up with the compositor, you need to be uh, as user AGL driver because there's, you know, the XDG uh, runtime directory and the Wayland display are, are set up and the um, AGL compositor is running under AGL driver, most importantly. So, and then the uninstall, that just uh, is running a batch command um, as user driver and it just removes from the temp folder where uh, it gets installed. And, and of course, when you're debugging on a device like this, hot reload isn't necessarily an option, right? Because um, you have a cache file system unless that gets updated. 
So in the case of install, again, using the same pattern, talking to port 2222 as AGL driver, makes the folder and then copies it over using SCP and then good to go. And in the case of run, so the, the, this dash T dash T double entry, what it does is when the session is lost, the TCP IP connection slash SSH connection is lost, it'll actually terminate the process, the SSH process. So with, with, without that entry, if you have a connection and then for some reason the, something, you shut down one side of the connection, you have an instance running on the target. And then if you try to reconnect, you have a failure because something already connected. So this dash T dash T is there to ensure that it cleans up nicely. And then when you reconnect, you don't have that problem. So in this case, we invoke uh, two things. We have, a, again, a JSON config, and then the um, app name, and then we have to set the observatory host to any IP address that allows us to talk to it remotely. And then it sets the observatory to a fixed port of one, two, three. Okay, and then in this case, an AGL, we have a default config, and that one's a little different than the other. So it's uh, context specific. We got the background pane, and then it's setting it to the default size, um, you know, the standard AGL size, which is 1920 by 1080, and it sets it to full screen. So that will um, do a full screen for us. And then back to the Flutter config. What else can we show here on? This, this pattern on the remote ones is um, the same, effectively. Uh, we're just not specifying a uh, predetermined port, right? So in the case of QMU, which is running on the host, um, you know, the QMU session, you have to set up the firewall such that this will talk to it. So in the case of Flutter Workspace Config, the other element is on the QMU session. We have it broken down between ARM64, Darwin, Ubuntu, and Fedora, um, but effectively, um, the primary arg, and so we have args x86 args arm64 qmu image, so image name, a kernel name, in the case of arm64. So on the, the the suffix determines the the variant, right? So they're treated independently, and the commands that show up in um, setup underscore env.sh are derived out of these key values here, right? So the combination would be, um, you know, we have the base QMU command, and then the args that are specific to x86-64, and then, you know, QMU image. So between those, and then you also have, depending on what uh, it's running on, then get some different flavored flags too. So if you're running on um, the M1, you get the base command, the args and uh, the kernel name and then the QMU image and then you get the additional Darwin flag set. So the resultant um, output in the case of an M1 looks very different than on an x86, etc. So that's how I'm handling the variations on that um, because each um, platform has unique requirements around QMU. So and in the case of the base uh, arguments here this is the firewall setup, right? So we specify we open up port 2222, and we also open up port 1234, which is set up for the observatory. So between these two ports, allow us from, lo you know, on localhost to talk to the uh, QMU image. And those values are effectively the same in the case of um, the M1 setup right here, right? 2222, 1234. So the access pattern is the same when you're running on a local host QMU session between targets. Uh, so I think that covers the, um, you know, how custom devices somewhat work. Uh, right presently, um, the debug scenario is only supported. So profile and uh, release are not supported. That's on um, the author of the feature and myself have discussed this a bit and um, we're going to do some work on this in the uh, upcoming quarter. 
around um, supporting additional modes here. So, so right now, you know, if, when we run and debug and talk to a device, whether it's a on host or remotely, it's it's to talk to it for debugging scenarios. And the the setup for profiling is largely interacting between the the uh, Dart VM and the web browser, right? So those the the um, that activity really doesn't uh, necessarily require the debugging. You're not going to single step and you know profile. The profiling is about running at full bore and looking at the trace data. So sort of different use cases. And in the release case, you know, it there's no debugging information, so you don't need a transport. You just execute it and run it on um, you know the device. So and that. So we, yeah, custom device is used to update and uh, set the config Flutter custom devices. And then there's that interaction between the QMU and that's about it. Like the, there's the string substitution shows up in there just to make it smaller and easier to read and prevent having to type things over and over again. And uh, yeah, so that covers that. Kirkstone Tools is the authoritative repository for this uh, script. Everything that, and ultimately what you would want to do is keep um, up to date with this the script here, not your config. The config may evolve depending on what features get added. So if like artifactory support and some other things get pulled in there, then um, it might you might want to update it against one of the reference configs. And here's the Garrett for Automotive Linux, the Meta AGL Devel. This is where you would find um, information on how to use Flutter Workspace Automation with AGL images. That's instructions specific to AGL. And then this last one is the Flutter like generic knowledge of using custom embedders. So the labs set up a Flutter Workspace, create AGL Flutter application, debug it using CLI and debug it using Visual Studio. I did run through that a bit. I think um, I'll leave this up to the to the viewers. This is uh, could be homework. Best way to learn something is by going through the motions and doing it. So it's, it's well documented. Okay, and then this is where I talk about the Linux GTK embedder. I get a lot of questions about this. Um, well, I think there's a lot of confusion because there's so many sort of variants of the of Flutter embed, embedders. So the Linux GTK embedder is, yes, it's a, what Google, the, the Google Flutter team considers it a first party um, platform. So Canonical is the primary development partner for the GTK embedder. Uh, the Flutter SDK only supports host only builds. So there's no cross compilation support in the Flutter tooling with the Linux GTK embedder. Now, in MetaFlutter, I do um, cross compile the Linux GTK shared module. So in theory, one would be able to uh, pass in the right parameters in the Flutter SDK uh, with a CMake toolchain file, you would be able to cross compile. Um, Comments on the Linux GTK embedder is that the runtime li library dependency list is very big. I, th I would consider it applicable to desktop class processors. So there's a, there's a lot of extra stuff in it that um, is a bit overkill for an embedded application. While you could make it work, sure, it's quick and easy and you can do cross-platform development and it all works great and you can use some plugins, but you're performance on an embedded device is going to be less than stellar because a it requires x11 right and um among other things so you know it's not an optimized experience for embedded linux flutter sdk support is missing to consume artifacts so meaning when i when i generate when i cross compile the linux gtk components desktop components in meta flutter it generates an SO and a gen snapshot and a couple other tools required to create an AOT. But the Flutter SDK tooling does not support that in any way yet. So I, I've had some dialogues with the area owner at, uh, on the Flutter team about this and 
the uh, basically the pushback was generate a design document so we can talk about this platform views so platform views is sort of a quick and easy way to get you uh, some sort of external surface um, interleaved with your your flutter hierarchy um, now there's been a long-standing issue that um, Chinmed opened a while back that discusses around the uh, horrible performance of platform views and effectively what happens is the using a platform view can decrease your frame rate dramatically so what happens is if you look at your widget hierarchy depending on where the platform view is one or two of them halfway down it may uh, have to stop that render pass go out and fetch it and then continue the rendering and depending on how that's done you can typically see a you know half of your frame rate drop so if you were targeting 60 fps you can easily see 30 fps with platform views and your east and your cpu time um, would go up my general recommendation is you want to avoid the usage of it and flutter auto does not support it for this reason um, Flutter Auto is about being a, an integrator toolbox, best in class, sort of giving you an optimal um, path forward without compromises. And, you know, we're not trying to please everybody with it right now as a solution. We're looking for creating, um, you know, experiences that will please and delight the consumer and sluggishness and other things like that are not on that list. Platform lit channels. So that's a Dart to native code bridge. Um, and approximately adds around 10 milliseconds of latency per message. So um, some things are, you know, if you think about your architecture of how you implement something, having this, everything serialized through this bridge, and then having this overhead, and um, it's not a really good combination of things. Um, it's suitable for lifecycle calls. Uh, so if you want to set up and tear down objects and things like that that don't happen at a, reg at a high frequency, um, or to support pre-existing platform constructs like um, tying into some um, platform channel things that you know are, are low frequency and maybe like platform info or you know a handful of things that are trigger a launching the browser things like that foreign function interface ffi this enables calling native c apis from dark code and, and incurs zero latency there's no message passing in terms of platform channels, there's no async, um, await on dark, no garbage collection. Um, this is the preferred model, right? So what you can do is you can use platform channels for the life cycle of your FFI, or you can directly just FFI load it up, um, depending on the, the um, actual use case. First party Linux plugins. So first party Linux plugins are only intended for Linux, GTK and better. The use of the term Linux plugins was poorly chosen, in my opinion. No, in no way does it mean that first-party Linux plugins work with any Flutter embedder that runs on Linux. Like that's that's where probably the number one confusion happens in the community. Like it, there's a, a matrix, support matrix on this plugin, and it says Linux. What do you mean you don't support it? Well, what it should say is <laughs> GTK um, embedder, you know, instead of Linux. So it's sort of a poor choice for um, branding that support. It should really be first-party Linux GTK plugins. Uh, the fact that first-party Linux plugin dark code runs in Flutter debug builds as a Flutter bug in its track here. Some solutions involve forking the Flutter SDK to support a custom plugin type, not a Linux. In my view, this is not a long-term solution. Um, RI drops the, the frequency uh, and how that Flutter SDK changes, uh, this is really not a, a, a good choice because it incurs such high maintenance overhead that it's not terribly practical. Huge amount of busy work. So it, it's basically cost of ownership goes really high. And um, I, I'm, I look at solutions where you decrease your cost of ownership and you decrease your NRE and et cetera. And so this is one here that I don't, um, think is a, a good near-term uh, well it's a near-term solution but it's also not a long-term solution build environment so the flutter embedded build environment comprises of yocto layers and some source code so yocto layers 
Meta AGL demo, Meta AGL devel, Meta AGL flutter, Meta flutter, and then flutter auto. So Toyota IVI home screen AGL branch is what's currently used. Meta AGL demo. A flutter image, the AGL IVI demo platform flutter image has runtime equals release and a series of flutter apps, dashboard, HVAC, that's a typo, uh, navigation, media player, meta AGL devel. This holds a handful of images, AGL image, flutter, runtime, debug, runtime profile, runtime release. Um, so for these, you really like, if you're doing a debug workflow, you don't necessarily um, want any applications installed. So, you know, your, your um, debug build would have no in apps installed and they would all originate from the host via um, a custom device connection. If you have a runtime release, then you either build the AOT externally on the host and then SCP it over to the target to run it. Um, but what you, the general approach is you want to avoid mixing up when you're running a debug versus a uh, release build. So release build and AOT actually compiles the Dart code down to the machine code, whereas in a debug, it's an interpreted. So it's far less performant. And so if you're going to do a demo, you really want to keep these ideas separate. And you really like, you know, upper management wants a demo. I'm not going to show them a, a debug build. Like that would be not a good thing. You would only want to show them a release build. BB appends in um, Meta AGL Flutter. So it disables the GStreamer build flag for Flutter Auto um, due to the commercial licensing uh, requirement. Enables network access for Archiver and adds a user service for Flutter Gallery. And then Meta Flutter, the other last uh, Yocto layer. This is considered the upstream um, Flutter app bundle structure. So what this is, is a folder structure that all the embedders that are present on MetaFlutter support, and it's modeled after the GTK runtime folder structure. So when you build a bundle, like Flutter build bundle on the command line, you end up with a build Flutter assets folder. And that is not the exact, exact same structure that you need for running the device. So you can do, you can create this with some sim links. So there's a variety of ways to do it, but this structure enables a number of things for each embedder. It allows you to do overriding system libraries and things like that. Easy swapping of versions, which I do take advantage of in the Flutter workspace automation. And recipes dev tools in MetaFlutter. We have depot tools, Flutter REST bridge example, membrane example, and then REST PROC2 support. This REST support item is a um, workaround to enable, well, it's sort of seen as the official solution right now. Actually, there's been a long going issue on Meta Rust on this. Um, the approach is you do a BB append and you reassign the source to be the uh, test standard lib, which has PROC2. So that is there. And the above two items are Rust uh, based projects and they require that. That's why that's there. And the graphics uh, recipes, there's a handful of apps. Um, trying to pull in things that are relevant. So AGL Flutter apps are somewhat of a sandbox on things that might be changing rapidly. Um, but that's where I tend to lock things. Uh, these are all locked. They're not, none of these are auto rev. So Flutter apps. Um, yeah, if, if one pops up, I will add it. Um, if someone has a recommendation that they think is, is useful for uh, like a functional test, like the animated background one, um, it's great for just sort of showing, you know, a bit of how the efficient the GPU is on the target um, and looking at your CPU load versus the performance, uh, etc., and your frame rate. So the um, Flutter Rust Bridge, the membrane example, those showcase a, you know, the model of using FFI with, um, you know, zero copy uh, scenarios. So um, those are highly, membrane is highly performant. And that's uh, what Toyota we, we use as our, the baseline for our FFI work. Uh, the Flutter test video player is the first party plugin. Another example where 
I have some implementation in Flutter Auto that um, you know talks the uh, language of the first party plugin. So secure storage, video player are, are two of those. The other recipes are Flutter Engine, Flutter Pi, Flutter SDK, Sonya Batters, Toyota. So for the Toyota recipes, there's two. There's Flutter Auto, which is correlates to the AGL branch, and IVI Home Screen, which correlates to the quarterly release. So IVI Home Screen on uh, Toyota Connected's GitHub is moved. The main branch is moved to quarterly quarterly releases, and um, the AGL branch has no restriction. So there might be some cherry picking from the AGL branch to main um, and vice versa, but it's just the cadence of that update. So major features will be coming in on IEA home screen, which then would get uh, pulled into Flutter Auto, the AGL branch. So the tooling, Flutter workspace automation, and again, it's the authoritative repo on this script, the Kirkstone CI jobs, Dunfell CI jobs. I try to get a representative sort of swath of um, devices. Um, there is some, there is a known issue around IMX6, and I believe it's the Dart VM has a problem with uh, the tuning that a particular DSP passes in, and so that, um, you know, IMX6. So that, there's always a trade off. If you go as low end as you can, you're going to have some NRE to deal with problems and, and the general recommendation is um, well you can and if you if someone you know forges that trail for you um, and sorts out the problem then that it's available um, but yeah these the cheapest one on this list I think is the Raspberry Pi Zero 2W and that can run a uh, you know a 2k display easy um, with no latency concerns or any problems it's a very high value and then the most expensive on this, uh, I'll let you think about that. Honester, um, it, this was at a point where I was focusing on making Vulkan work on RPI 3 and 4. There's a, uh, there's a driver that exists for 3 pre-4s. Uh, it's not 100% compliant, but it does most things like it'll play uh, Quake and whatnot. All right, and Flutter Auto, last component of the build area is IVA home screen. This is uh, Wayland based, so it supports AGL shell up to V2, V3 is coming before the end of the quarter, uh, XDG shell, uh, stable. So the model here is that the same code runs on desktop and on a target device. So there's no pound defines about either or. The only difference then really is the, the graphics stack, right? That implements the um, you know, from DRM, you know, and the drivers down basically is where the delta happens. And there's plenty of variance between implementations there. Multi-view is a feature that allows single process, multiple engines per surface. So, uh, well, a, an engine per surface. So you can have multiple surfaces all with its own engine instance all running within a single process, similar to how Fuchsia does it. Backend support at compile time, not runtime detectable. The point is to shrink down the executable, EGL and Vulkan. Has a very um, flexible configuration front end uh, that involves JSON uh, and bundle override logic. And recently um, I've added a feature called Compositor Surface plugin, uh, which I'll have a demo of that. Here's an example of a compositor surface unit test case in action. There's three surfaces, Wayland surfaces here. One is the gray, one is the flutter that's running a Vulkan backend. The one on the left is the EGL, it's a map box um, instance, and then the Vulkan PBR on the right. So two Vulkan surfaces, one EGL. In this scenario, I'm exercising the constructor and destructor of the map instance. And that's uh, two EGL surfaces simultaneously in a single process. So, single process for everything.
and more spine. So some of the command line options for Glutterado. So this um, is all pretty well documented in README for the source tree. And um, you can either do manual overrides on the command line or you can specify them in a JSON config file. And then any parameter you pass that is not consumed by the argument handlers, it gets directly passed to the Dart VM. So um, it's easy to pass things to the Dart VM directly ad hoc. So the parameter loading order for JSON. So there's a view, global, and then CLI. So a view is um, defining a, a window effectively, and within the window, you know, its own context. And then you have the global umbrella over that, and then CLI above that. So first it'll look at view specific parameters, and then those get overwritten by global parameters in the JSON. And then all of that gets overwritten by CLI arguments. So if you had a multi-view scenario with four windows, and you wanted to change one parameter on that, um, you could do that via CLI, just um, append the command to the command line argument list, and it would override whatever was in your JSON. So the bundle override logic uh, will, so you can basically create a structure where you can have multiple versions of the same app or bundles. So you could have one bundle that ran you know, 337, and you had one bundle that you could run 331. So each of each of those versions requires specific ICU DTL DAT, and each one requires a little Flutter and Engine version, right? So those have to match um, what, what the, it's built with, right? So this allows you to sandbox each app independent of one another. It doesn't have to always use the uh, Flutter Engine version in the system folder. If you built a fresh image with OS and you owned all the apps and nothing changed or moved, then it would make sense to just use a system-based libflutter engine.so, which is the default install. So the default build flags for Flutter Auto, there's a few of them. So it's componentized in a way that you can effectively just turn off all the code that you don't want or you don't need. And, and by in general, you should, it's better to do that. Um, although if, you know, you have an app now and then you want to introduce some functionality later that depends on one of these, then, you know, obviously you would want to enable that as needed. So the CI jobs on this are located here. And when building the source, the best reference for figuring out how to build it is looking at the CI job. And then labs here, running Flutter apps, auto run Flutter app using a system service multi-view and run Flutter app and runtime profile image. So we have these laid out nicely. So here's the case of multi-view. So in the JSON, you specify, so each one of these views, it's an array of, of views, right? Each one here is specifying the bundle path, the window type, this is in the case of the AGL compositor, so you can specify different panes in the AGL compositor which you want it to pin to. So in this one, this is a single process Flutter Auto instance with this configuration will um, put an app on the background pane, the panel top, and the panel left, and they're all independent apps, and they all have different sizes. Um, accessibility features is just that's saying enable all the bits uh, for accessibility so like there's flags in there where you can turn off motion like fast motion and things like that that are applicable to automotive so you can have a and then you can dynamically change that as well but um, here's an example here where it uh, the lab walks you through it this is running the QMU AGL image so you can see in the background it has the pump fuel app on the top, we have an animated background example right here. And on the left, we have an EGL texture test case, right? That's just rendering this with GL. So, and then this shows you how to do set up a profiling instance on uh, AGL. So, 
this is what uh, you end up with. You can effectively profile it, right? So under the CPU profile, you can enable it, and then it uh, will enable. So what happens in the profile image is you have trace markers that are interspersed throughout the code, which are enabled as part of the build flag. And so that allows it to work with a CPU profiler. So when you run the C you enable the CPU profiler, and you run it, you get um, very interesting um, trace events. It's a listing, similar to like uh, Windows ETL tracing or something like that. And then um, it allows you to look at latencies and interactions at a, at a much lower level. So a very um, useful troubleshooting tool when you're um, working on the finer nuances of a uh, you know UI design. And here we are to the resources. I uh, highly recommend docs.flutter.dev. Lots of great Flutter development info. The Flutter wiki also contains quite a bit of information about the Flutter engine that could be useful. And in general, Yocto, MetaFlutter, Avi Home Screen, etc. The AGL compositor information is really great. Documentation on automotivelinux.org. I recommend that. And that concludes the presentation. So thank you for your time. I appreciate your attendance. And any questions, please feel to reach out to me at joel.vanarska at gmail.com. Thank you.